Welcome to Horror Babble. Today, we're thrilled to commence the very first Horror Babble Spotlight Week, in which we'll be narrating a number of new and original stories by up and coming authors from across the globe. The first story this week, How to Exercise a Haunted House, is by Betty Robertson, a writer at Ubisoft Montreal. She has recently worked on a number of popular games, including Assassin's Creed Odyssey. See the video description below for more details on Betty, including her Twitter handle. The story details the steps necessary to effectively rid a haunted house of spooks and other things that go bump in the night, as demonstrated by the Shaw family. We hope you enjoy this one. How to Exercise a Haunted House by Betty Robertson All houses past a certain age are haunted, if only by poor decorative choices. Memories of previous occupants splash the walls like coats of paint. Many don't know the steps that need to be taken to truly rid the space of bad spirits. First, moving must not be done alone. Strength in numbers. The best numbers are iterations of three, seven, and thirteen, but any will do in a pinch. The Shaw family piles one, two, three, four, five, six, and soon to be seven out of the car, a handsome grey Cadillac. The parents are a matched set, both well dressed with clever eyes and dark hair. Their eldest, Billy, is in the lanky stage of adolescence. Twins, King and Nina, take most after their mother with slick hair, pale skin, and beauty marks. Together they look like the masks of comedy and tragedy, King stuck in a perpetual smile, and Nina a scowl. The youngest is Hazel, a little freckled girl with a dark cloud of hair. Boxes and bags are left in the trunk for just a moment, just for time to take in the air around the house. The front lawn is overgrown with weeds and unkempt bushes. The house itself, once a powder blue, has faded to grey. It's a bit of a fixer-upper, says Robert Shaw, the father. It's perfect, says matriarch Evelyn Shaw, cradling her swollen belly. Second, ghosts thrive in quiet spaces. They are the bumps and creaks in the night. They fill silent spaces, playing tricks on the nervous mind. The shiny brass gramophone hisses and pops before coming to life with a throb of bass and percussion. Robert holds a hand out to his wife. Darling, how long has it been since we last danced? Oh, Bobby, hours. Evelyn smiles. It's the only time that their parents will let them make the most noise possible, so the children go wild. Billy, the eldest, takes out her tap shoes and makes a path through the house. They find all of the problem spots, under the stairs, the basement, the bathroom, the long upstairs hallway. Their moving feet stir up dust, and with it, fresh faces scowling from the walls and floor. Third, once you've drawn the ghosts out, draw chalk circles around them. These spots won't move, but the faces might disappear, so don't miss any. We got that striped wallpaper for this hallway, right, Bobby? Evelyn asks her husband. Swing music bleeds through the floorboards from the gramophone spot downstairs. Mom, I want a purple room, the youngest daughter, Hazel, announces. Of course, sweetheart, she says, not really listening. Robert runs his finger around the ring of red chalk circling the grotesque face growing out of the wall. Yes, I think stripes is a good look for this wall. What do you think, Casper? He asks the face. It moans lowly. Fourth, after binding the spirits, you can set about removing them. It's not all too different from getting rid of a spider. Big jar, please, Robert says. Their only son, King, is long-limbed and eager to help his father. He hands the jar, reserved for lemonade and herbal iced tea, to Robert. Robert slots the glass against the wall. The ghoul in the wall begins to fidget and shake getting aggressive at being caught. "'Honey, have you got the spell?' he asks, sweat beading on his brow. 
Evelyn pushes past her son, slip of paper in hand, and slides it along the wall. The paper glows on impact, shoving the spirit out of the house and into the jar. It rattles the glass, shrieking in fear. Lid, Davy, she says calmly. King fumbles for the lid, almost dropping it in his eagerness to give it over. Is he going to make our lemonade taste icky? Hazel asks. Evelyn tightens the lid and holds it up for all to see. Maybe a little spicy, but we'll be sure to clean it out properly. Fifth, just like spiders, spirits need to be freed where they can't get back into the house. Be careful with letting them out. They can be aggressive and frightened. The glass jars clink against each other as the wagon moves. Twins, King and Nina, hold its sides. Hazel pulls the wagon. She eagerly volunteered, but her little legs are still very clumsy, so her older siblings steady it like a rickety cart. "'Are we there yet?' Hazel asks. "'Daddy said it's supposed to be over this hill,' says Billy, who leads the way. The little ramshackle graveyard sits under a withered apple tree. The fence around it was once brick and mortar, but was transmuted into stone and moss over the years. Billy picks one of the smaller jars, one of the smaller, easier spirits, a cat under the stairs, to demonstrate to her siblings. Okay, unscrew the lid slowly and make sure to concentrate on it. Don't get distracted or it might get into you. It's nice to say a few words to calm it down, and then set it on one of the graves. I think this kitty will like sleeping on the wall. She picks a patch of worn-down stone and moss. There's a big patch of fading sun on it. Here you go, Miss Kitty. Have a good nap, Billy says, letting the spirit out. It's a ball of purple fog until it takes shape. Then the cat circles the spot three times before settling. Wow! My turn, my turn! Hazel exclaims. Nina's eyes grow huge as her sister's excitement almost knocks the jaws over. Watch it! she yells. Hazel sticks her tongue out and reaches for the big jar. It's Billy who stops her. That one's too dangerous for us. We need Mommy to set him loose. The ghost inside presses his horrible grimace against the glass. Hazel pouts as she's given a tiny jar instead. Bye, Mr. Rat, she says, dumping it out in the grass. Have a good rest, King says to the poltergeist he frees. The poltergeist immediately starts throwing apples at them. Great choice, genius, Nina says to her twin. Sorry. They have to retreat, taking the rickety wagon back down the dirt path towards the house. Hey, where did the big jar go? King asks. Oops, Hazel says. I, I left it in the field. Billy rubs her temples and sighs. I'll tell Mom when we get back. Sixth. There's nothing quite like a fresh coat of paint to brighten the house up, but it does make things smell awful. This is the best step to burn sage. It gets all of the old smells out of the house and can provide a soothing atmosphere. Spirits hate it, so any lingering and untethered from the house will flee at this stage. Robert's up on the ladder, getting the corners with fresh primer, when the kids come thundering. D dad Dad! We lost a— Hazel dropped. Dad! And then he threw apples at us. Robert slowly gets down off the ladder, wondering for just a moment why they decided that a fifth child was a good idea. Billy, status update, he says. We left the big jar out by the graveyard because a loose poltergeist started throwing apples at us, she says. He asked her because Billy never assigns blame for mistakes. Okay, we'll go and fetch it tomorrow. It's getting dark outside, and your mum and I still need lots of help with painting. Seventh, the first meal doesn't need to be prepared in-house. In fact, take-out is recommended after all the steps. It should, however, be eaten together, on whatever makeshift table setting one can secure. The twins share an upended crate, plate of food slung across their combined lap space. We'll eat Chinese take-out on fine china— and drink grape juice from golden goblets, Evelyn says with a smile. Do we remember what box we packed the soy sauce in? Billy asks from her spot on the counter. I left the bottle. It was just dregs. We'll have to get some more tomorrow, Robert says. King scoots the bag over closer with his foot, 
to inspect its remaining contents. They gave us plum sauce, he offers. Billy sighs and sets her fried rice aside. Finish it or no fortune cookie, Evelyn says. Billy folds her arms, refusing to touch the rice. Eighth and the final step. The first night is always difficult, getting used to those new creaks and groans. The house must become accustomed to life again. Its walls must warm with human breath, and its pipes must accommodate common use again. Beds unbuilt, mattresses on the floor, and chilled sleeping bags instead of the duvets buried at the bottoms of bags. No one sleeps well during the first night's exhaustion. The house is too cold, but the windows are open to get rid of the paint smell. It's common on the first night to be drawn downstairs, to snack, to read, to do anything but stare at the ceiling and beg for sleep. Don't do it, not even if you hear your mother calling. Do not leave your room on that first night, for that is when the remaining old inhabitants reorganize themselves. Keep your door closed and your limbs covered. It will be over soon. Soon your life will bleed into the walls, but give the unlife time to say goodbye. Why can't I sleep in my new room? Hazel whines. The paint's still drying in that one. Evelyn half lies. I don't want to sleep with Billy. Her feet smell. Hazel whispers. Hey, they do not, Billy says. It's either sleep with Billy or with me and your mother, and you know that I snore. Robert scoops Hazel up and makes an exaggerated snort noise that turns into a raspberry on her exposed belly. Hazel shrieks and laughs, pawing at his face for mercy. Hazel, like all seven-year-olds, is a fussy sleeper guaranteed to prevent Billy from getting any sleep. Billy, I'm thirsty, she says. Then drink from the water bottle, Billy says, voice half muffled by her pillow. That's stale water. I want fresh water, Hazel says. I filled it up just before we went to bed, Billy groans. Defeated, Hazel crawls across the mattress to grab the bottle and take a few sips. Hazel, a voice calls from downstairs. Billy's awake and alert now. Don't, she whispers. It's Mom. Hazel reaches for the knob. Billy speed crawls out of bed, grabbing the knob at the same time. It begins to rattle at the contact, and Billy winces. It's cold, Hazel whimpers. The voice from downstairs is suddenly outside. Girls, are you okay? Come downstairs. Me and Daddy made cocoa, it says with motherly warmth. Billy's teeth are chattering, but she laughs out loud. Bold of you to assume our parents have the energy to make cocoa. The rattling stops. Billy puts herself between Hazel and the door. Something heavy bashes against the door, loud enough to make the hinges creak. Hazel screams into her hand. Get in bed, Billy hisses. Hazel shakes her head, too scared to move. There's a long silence, and the cold passes, followed by the sound of a creaking door and footsteps. Guys, did you hear that? asks King from behind the door. Billy grits her teeth and turns away. She takes Hazel to bed with her and curls around her sister, both still shivering. Guys, there's something out here. Let me in, King yells. Cover your ears, okay? Billy says. Hazel, with fat tears rolling down her cheeks, nods. Help me, Billy, Hazel, please! King screams rise to a fever pitch. There are sounds of wet meat, snapping bone, and frayed wood. Billy wakes up with her fingers still in her ears, and Hazel snoring. She inspects the door. It's untouched except for a splatter of purple paint from the ceiling. Out in the hall, there's just a stack of boxes and some drop sheets. In the kitchen, King's manning the toaster while Mum poaches eggs. Sleep well? she asks. Billy laughs mirthlessly and hugs her brother. Addendum. There is a ninth and crucial step. 
Under no circumstances, must you say? This is great, just the new start our family needs, declares Robert. You have been listening to How to Exercise a Haunted House by Betty Robertson. Be sure to join us again tomorrow, Tuesday 23rd, for the week's second Spotlight offering. And until then, 